Hey YouTube, in this one I want to talk about these two characters, ref option T and option ref T, and what the difference is and when and why you might choose to use one versus the other in, let's say, a function signature. Now I'll spoil it right off the bat, I'm going to be arguing that you should never choose ref option T and you should always choose option ref T, and I'll explain why. So let's get into it. So let's say that we have a struct called data, and we don't really know what's in there, but let's just assume that it's arbitrarily large and note that it does not implement copy or clone. So it's just some mystery data that we can only move around and only has one API, which is a public method called crunch, which takes the data, crunches it, and gives us back an integer. So keep this struct in mind. This is a type I'm gonna be using throughout this video. Now let's say that I'm creating another type called widget that maybe has a data inside of it. So the most natural way to express that is just by having a field of type option data. And let's say that I wanna write an accessor that lets users of widget look at my data if I have it. So there's two different ways that you might be tempted to write an accessor or getter like this. The first one is slightly more natural. It's a method called data A that just returns a reference to the option data that's stored inside widget. Now there's another version of the same getter that you could write that I'm gonna call data B that doesn't return a reference to an option, it returns an option reference. And you see that the implementation is slightly different. I have to use this as ref method on my option, which converts it from a reference to an option to an optional reference. So this is two different approaches to pretty much the same API. And so which one's better? Well, I already spoiled what I think, but take a moment to think about what you think. What are these two different function signatures saying to the caller? What are the different restrictions that they place on the caller? And what restrictions do they place on you as the author of a widget? So in my opinion, the difference between these two function signatures becomes much more obvious if you go ahead and add mute to everything. Suddenly, there's a salient difference between returning a mutable reference to an option versus an optional mutable reference. In this top one, I'm saying, hey, I'm storing my data in an option, and here is mutable access to that option that I'm using to store my data. And you, the caller, can do whatever you want with it. You can set it to none so that I no longer have data, or you can also get at the underlying data and mutate it. For this bottom one, what the caller can do is slightly more restricted. They can mutate my data, but they can't change whether or not I have data. Because I'm not saying here's a reference to the way that I'm storing my data. I'm just saying, here's a reference to my data if I have any. And so there is an actual semantic difference between these two. And so there actually are valid reasons why you would choose one of these over the other, depending on how much power you're trying to give your caller. Although I do want to point out that if you are just returning a mutable reference to the entire option that holds your data, you might as well just make it pub so that your caller can just access it directly. So I hope that adding mute kind of helps clarify your intuition about the difference between these two things. And I'm gonna argue that even when we remove mute, that difference in the meaning of these two function signatures remains. Data A is saying, I am storing my data in an option, and here is a reference to that option. Data B is saying, I may or may not have some data, but if I do, here's a reference to it. Now, unlike with the mute example, where I pointed out that there may or may not be a good reason to use one over the other because they actually have semantic differences, I'm going to argue that data A never makes sense. In other words, using an immutable reference to an option in an API that you're writing never makes sense. It's never better than using an optional reference, and it's frequently worse. By the way, I do want to mention for completeness that references to options show up all the time in your Rust code. For example, anytime you call a method on an option that takes a ref self, you're using an immutable reference to that option. So I'm not saying this type shall never appear in the normal flow of your Rust code. In fact, it very likely will. I'm just saying that you shouldn't use it as a tool for designing APIs. So let's see why. So to help illustrate this, let's imagine a call site of these methods. So I have a widget that's just defaulted, and I'm calling both methods and storing them into A and B respectively. And I have the types annotated here just so we can remember which one is which. Now, first off, these are gonna be equivalent in terms of whether the option has anything in it or not. 
In other words, this assert is always going to succeed, at least with the way that we've implemented them at the moment. And I point this out because you might think that having an actual reference to the option that the widget is using, like we have an A, might give us some interesting visibility into that somehow, like we had with the mute example, where we could actually change what was in the option. But you can't do that with an immutable option. So all you can do is ask questions like, is sum? But what I'm pointing out here is we can also just ask B if it's sum. So having an actual reference to the option that's inside the widget doesn't actually give us anything that we couldn't also do with an optional reference. So we don't gain anything by having a reference to the actual option that widget is using. But we do lose things. For example, let's try and get at the underlying data because I want to call the crunch method on it. So all I have to do is call map on A to get at the inner data and then call crunch on that right? Well, the Rust compiler disagrees. I get this error that I can't move out of star A, which is behind a shared reference. And you're probably familiar with this error if you use a lot of options in Rust. A lot of times you want to call map on an option, but map actually moves out of the source option. And so if it's an option that you're not allowed to move out of, like one that you only have through a shared reference, you have to first convert it into your own option that you can move out of. And the way you do that is with as ref. And you can see that the error even suggests that. So we better fix it. If we just insert as ref here, this compiles just fine. Now what about crunch B? Well, this just works out of the box because we are allowed to move out of B. Because if you recall, we already called as ref inside the implementation of data B. So B is just a value in this scope that we have ownership over and we can move out of it. And in fact, option ref data implements copy, so we can even keep using B after this line if we want to. So in order to get to the underlying data inside of A, we have to use as ref anyway. So everywhere that we've called data A, now at every call site, we also have to call as ref if we want to get at the underlying data. Whereas for data B, we already took care of that for you. The caller doesn't need to worry about it. So data B is just a more convenient, easier to use API. So that's how option ref t can make a call site prettier than ref option t. Now there's another argument that I kind of hinted at earlier, but I glossed over a little bit, which is that data b here provides better encapsulation and more implementation flexibility than data a does. For example, you remember how I said data might be arbitrarily large? Maybe one day we're profiling and we discover that storing data directly inside widget is having a negative performance impact. Maybe we're moving lots of widgets around and having the actual data contained inside the widget is just getting to be too much. So we decide to put data on the heap instead and have widget just hold a pointer to it using box. So now we've wrapped our data in a box and immediately we have to go change the signature of data A because we no longer have an option data to return a reference to. We actually have to return a reference to our option box data now. And this isn't just annoying to have to go change your function signature. This might actually break code that was calling data A before. For example, the previous code snippet that explicitly spelled out the type of A as reference to option data, that call site no longer compiles. We have to go fix that one too. So this is actually a breaking API change that you have to make to widget for what should just be tweaking an implementation detail. So this provides no encapsulation for you and the details of how exactly you've chosen to store your data. Data B, on the other hand, we do still have to change the implementation, and I'm using the asDref method to get us there. This uses the deref trait on the underlying box to give us an optional reference to the data that it points to. But the important thing to note here is that I did not have to change the signature. So no one except me has to know that I even made this change. All of my call sites continue to work exactly how they did. And this is the essence of encapsulation. I wanna be able to make changes like this to widget without having this ripple effect throughout my code base where I have to go fix tons of stuff because my API leaked too many implementation details about how exactly I was storing my data. And this isn't the only type of example of this. Just for another one real quick, let's say that something in my business logic changed I no longer want to just always let the caller see my data if I have it. I also want to check some other condition first before telling the caller, yes, I have data for you to look at. So for data B, this is trivial. All you have to do is add a filter to the option that you're about to return 
with your extra business logic in it to decide whether the caller should see your data or not. But for data A, filtering this option further based on some predicate is impossible. If you're returning a reference to an option box data that you own, there's no reasonable way to apply filtering on it before returning it to the caller. And if you don't believe me, try to get it to work yourself. I bet you could come up with something that compiles, but not something that anyone should realistically ever write. So far, I've only talked about ref option T versus option ref T as return types. So let's take a moment and look at them as parameter types. So here I have do something A, which takes a ref option data, and do something B, which takes an option ref data. Now the same intuition we've been building for the difference between these two things holds here as well, just sort of in reverse. So do something A is telling the caller, give me a reference to the option that you are using to store your data. So it forces the caller to be holding their data in an option, which like, why? If do something A wants access to the data, it's gonna have to call as ref anyway inside of the implementation. And besides that, there's just no reason to force the caller to have their data inside of an option. Do something B allows the caller to have their data wherever and just stick a reference to it inside of an option. And it also gives the caller the ability to do things like filter that option, just like we did inside of our data B accessor. So do something B just gives you more flexibility and to see it in action, let's look at an example call site. So let's say that I have some data that I get somehow and note that it's not an option data, it's just some data that I actually have. And now I wanna call both of these functions with it. Now notice that I actually had to call do something a second because this call is going to move out of my data because I have to move it into the option that do something a is asking me for. So I couldn't have put it first because then I wouldn't be able to call do something b afterward. Do something B is no problem. I just create a new option using a reference to my data. Now keep in mind that do something A only works here at all because I'm allowed to move out of data. If data was instead something else that I'm not allowed to move out of, like a shared reference, it's no longer possible to call do something A with this data. I can't even do something nasty like clone it into a temporary option because data doesn't implement clone. So I literally cannot call this function using this data. Do something B doesn't even break a sweat here. All you do is remove the ampersand, although you actually don't even have to. So do something B is useful regardless of whether I actually have my data in an option or not. Whereas do something A, if I don't have my data in the exact right shape at the call site, it might be impossible to call, which if you ask me is not a very useful function. So once again, option ref T is a better choice for parameter types than ref option T. So now let's look at the data layout in memory of option T, ref option T, and option ref T. Partly because it supports my argument about using option ref T wherever you can, but mostly just because it's kind of fun. So as a disclaimer, Rust itself does not actually guarantee that much about how these values are laid out in memory. So take all of this with the tiniest grain of salt, but I'm gonna be showing how things tend to work in practice. So here I have two values of type option I32. The top one is none and the bottom one is sum 42. So you can see that for both of these, I have a byte at the front that says which option variant is active, none or sum. In the none case, it's zero. And in the sum case, it's one. Now these bytes are followed by some padding so that my 32-bit integer payload is correctly aligned. And that padding is followed by the payload. So in the none case, it's just grayed out. We don't know what's in there it's probably garbage. In the sum case, it has the integer value 42 in it. Now along comes ref option I32. So a reference in Rust is the size of a pointer on your architecture. In this case, I'm assuming 64-bit. So this pointer is eight bytes wide and it's pointing directly at the option, specifically at the beginning of the option where the enum discriminant byte is. Now I'm gonna show option ref I32, but before I do, take a moment and see if you can guess what it's gonna look like. Here it is. Is this what you expected? If you expected a discriminant byte in red, followed by some padding, followed by a pointer value, that would be a reasonable guess. But it's actually wrong. The Rust compiler is smarter than that. The Rust compiler knows that references can never be null. In other words, a valid reference can never have a bit pattern that's all zeros. And that includes the ref I32 inside of this option. So the Rust compiler says, well, all zeros can never be a valid reference 
So instead of adding an extra byte to track whether this is none or sum, I'll just use all zeros to mean none for option ref i32. If I see an option ref i32 and it's all zeros, I'll just know that that means it's none. This is called a niche optimization, and the Rust compiler is very smart and does a lot of these things for you. And it's really, really cool, and it's a cool topic that you should go learn a lot about if this piques your interest. But the takeaway here is that option ref i32 has no space overhead over just a regular reference. It's essentially just a reference that can also be null. And mostly I just think this is really cool, and I wanted to mention it. The last thing I want to talk about in the debate between ref option t and option ref t is what if you're inside a function where you really do need an option t with ownership? Like take this function, for example. It's called I need ownership, and it's taking in an option ref i32, but inside it needs an option i32. So wouldn't this be a good example of a time when it would make sense to take a parameter of type ref option i32? I would still say no, because that imposes all of the problems on the caller that we talked about before, and if you need an option i32, it's actually really easy to convert an option ref i32 into an option i32, and there's more than one way to do it. One way is to map over the contained ref i32 using the to owned trait. The to owned trait usually just ends up calling clone on the reference that you give it, but it's a little bit more general than that. In particular, if you give it something like a reference to a slice, it'll convert that into a vec. Another way of doing this that I prefer because it's shorter is just calling the cloned method. The cloned method exists for option ref t where t is sized, and it just literally calls clone on the underlying reference, which is usually just fine. The only downside over to owned is that, like I said, to owned is slightly more general and that it'll do stuff like convert slices to vec, whereas dot cloned will simply fail to compile for slices. Lastly, if your type also implements copy on top of clone, you can just use the copied method, which just calls copy on the underlying reference to give you an owned value using the copy trait. And this one's my favorite. I'll use copied if I can get away with it. I'll use cloned if my type doesn't implement copy. And I'll use to owned if I'm doing something fancy or if I'm writing a generic function and I want it to work on dynamically sized types like slices. But even better than all of those things we just talked about, if I need ownership over an option i32 inside my function, why don't I just say that in the parameter type? Then the caller can figure out how best to get me one. Maybe they have one sitting around that they don't mind moving out of into my function, or maybe they know they need to clone something to make it happen. But either way, I like this function signature much better because it's more honest about what this function needs. It needs an owned option i32. So there's no sense in lying about that by taking a reference. So that's all I've got for today. I hope you have a better intuition for the difference between ref option t and option ref t. And I hope I've helped convince you that ref option t, that is an immutable reference to an option only makes your code harder to work with and your APIs less useful. That being said, I certainly haven't seen every use case under the sun. And if you have a valid use case for an immutable reference to an option, I'd love to hear about it. Leave me a comment if you haven't already. <laughs> Aside from that, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.